Hey everybody, uh, best albums of 2020. Here we go. How did I assess this? Easy. It was stuff I paid money for. Uh, what do I usually buy when I'm paying money for an album? Usually I'm buying vinyl because it usually, if not holds its value, it appreciates in value, which is pretty cool. In fact, a couple albums we're going to look at, and this is just literally just a handful of albums. I think it's like six or seven. Um, they're worth a lot of money, even over the course of like nine months. So that's pretty neat. Um, uh, and then I did want to say, uh, I did like a couple hip hop albums this year. Specifically, I liked, uh, Don't Blame It On Baby by DaBaby. Um, I'm more of a DaBaby fan than a Lil Baby fan. <laughs> For those of you into that dichotomy, uh, I think it, that's the word. Dichotomy, I don't know. Um, and then I also like the new Big Sean album, but it seems like hip hop artists make their money off of streams as opposed to actual album sales, to which I say good for them. You know, that's that's the future. One of my favorite artists nowadays is Charlie XCX, and she fully, fully embraces songwriting for, for non-physical releases, not even for album releases. She writes for singles, which is totally badass. But anyway, I just wanted to say you, there were some good hip hop albums this year, but you won't, won't see them here because you couldn't really buy them in any format. All right, just due to kind of weird circumstances, I did buy one MP3 album this year, and that's the first one I want to go over. Um, I bought Fires in Heaven by Salem for my brother for Christmas. Uh, it's Salem's first album in 10 years, which is a pretty big deal. And as you might expect, they've changed a lot over the course of a decade. Um, their production is a lot less heavy-handed. The songs have a lot more... Um, I'd say much more of a measured flow of soft and heavy and busy versus more sparse and that sort of thing. And it generally, generally sound a lot more professional all around. Like you could see them as producers. I think it's two guys like making music for an actual like hip hop single that was going for a Grammy or something. Um, they're, they're very sleek producers nowadays. And I liked the variety of just sometimes bizarre but beautiful things on their new album for instance the album opens with a guy rapping over a symphony um i've been like racking my brain how salem got a symphony i guess it was just strings like i don't know i guess yeah it's it's very convincing the opening track like that you're listening to a symphony and a guy rapping about uh, how he ain't got shit to tell y'all uh, i believe is a quote from the lyrics I did want to say that even though I think, as one would expect, Fires in Heaven is a much more uh, mature and uh, kind of streamlined and just smooth and not rough around the edges album than King Knight was in 2010, I do think King, King Knight has some immediacy and like vitality that the new album doesn't have. And, is pro and that immediacy and vitality is probably pretty heavily attributable to how popular Salem became. I mean, they went 10 years without releasing anything and, you know, they released this and their band camp like blows up. So I just wanted to say like, even though uh, their new album makes King Knight from 2010 almost obsolete production wise, that album still very much has a place in the Salem canon, if not still at the top of the Salem canon. So another album I'm going to talk about that I don't have on hand to like hold up and do the tactile thing with is uh, Bleached Waves by a guy named Zune. This is his debut, I think, album in general, but at the very least label debut. Um, he's on Paper Bag Records based out of Canada. They're a really great label. You should check them out. Been around a long time and uh, do a lot of good stuff for a lot of good artists. But uh, that album, I ordered it um, and it got lost in the mail, so... But I did pay for it, which is the criteria for this video. But um, Zune makes shoegaze. It's really well done shoegaze. There's not very much shoegaze you can say that about. It's also a little bit unique, which is even rarer in the shoegaze world. A band not trying to sound like Loveless by My Bloody Valentine, which is still the greatest shoegaze album ever and probably always will be. I would say definitely always will be. Um, shoegaze is one of those rare genres that at its inception, it was perfect, and nobody's going to make it any more perfect, I don't think. Basically, making shoegaze is kind of a waste of time. <laughs> but um, uh, Zune, he 
he d- does a little spin on shoegaze and calls it moccasin gaze. Um, the guy lives on a Native American, um, and I say American because Canada, th- this guy's in Canada. Canada is still a North American, so Native American. I guess that's correct. Uh, I'm going to use it. I think it's correct. Um, but he lives on a Native American reservation in Canada, and he some of the rhythms he derived, and this is just going like from, from the press release, but you can actually hear it in the music. Like It's not just a gimmick or something that happens for 10 seconds or some bullshit. Throughout the album, he uses rhythms that really perk your ears, and it's because I guess he kind of pulled them from like tribal music, like Native American traditional music, which is really dope, and then combines that with shoegaze, and it's a really cool pairing. Uh, both are very... Uh, spiritual and spiritual types of music and types of music that strive for transcendence, I think. So very, very compatible. Um, And he's the only one to do something like that, which I think is totally badass. And then I wanted to say a lot of shoegaze can feel kind of abstract and impersonal. Um, Zune does a good job of making his shoegaze, not just good shoegaze, because it's it's very good. It's very well executed with, uh, I think I read somewhere the gear he used with pretty minimal gear, which is pretty amazing. Um, But it has a very personal feel to it. And, you know, I can't really understand anything that he says, but apparently he talks about, um, like, alcoholism and stuff that plagues um, Native American reservations. And uh, even though I can't really, like, verbally glean that from the album, you can definitely tell that he's singing about some real stuff and some stuff that means something to him personally um, in a kind of painful and kind of yearning way. So uh, a really good release from him this year, and it'll be cool to see what the future holds for Zoom. All right, y'all, we're up to the first album that I paid money for that I actually have sitting here um, in the room, and it's going to be a band called Cow Regards. Search Cow Regards on Instagram to to check them out. But they're a, from my understanding, combination Chinese and German uh, production team. Um, they had an EP in late 2016 that I think is still their most popular release. Um, throughout the course of, I think, 2019 and definitely 2020, they released four EPs, and they tied the, these four EPs into their first uh, physical release, which somewhat ironically is called Internet, because they believe the Internet is the future of music, kind of just like I was talking about earlier with Charlie XCX. Um, So it's kind of ironic that I'm holding this. I guess they wanted to make some money. I ordered this and it came all the way from Berlin, which is pretty cool. But uh, where's the like, there's a blurb about this album and it is is really quirky. Um, What is it? Uh, I think they say that this is supposed to represent the four elements of the internet, which are rage, drugs, love, and epic. I think those are the four elements of the internet. So this album is supposed to be a deconstruction of the four elements of any given thing, including the video you're watching right now on the uh, on the internet. So uh, it's tough to say no to that. And then production-wise, uh, this album uh, puts on the center stage a lot of hip-hop production that's really... Uh, you know, just kind of danceable and well done. Not too dissimilar to Salem in that respect. But whereas Salem meld hip-hop with a bunch of, like, gritty subsonic synths and ultimately create this kind of goth, this downtrodden kind of goth vibe, uh, Cow Regards are a lot more positive and a lot more funky. Um, they combine some really good hip-hop production with, like, four-to-the-floor dance music, which isn't super uncommon for most producers. Um, but they combine it with some cool jazzy chords and just kind of playful playful textures and song structures that I think keep the listener engaged throughout the song. Their songs also usually have a really good hook. Um, General Ling on this album is really good, as is uh, Swear. Um, Swear is probably my favorite thing they've put out, although on their EP from 2016 there was this Dolphin song that I still think is a pretty undefeatable jam. Uh, I guess in in way of criticism of this album, I will say, and this is the case with most uh, dance music, like you can see the Toki Monsta poster behind me. Um, Toki Monsta is amazing. You know, I've seen her live. I've kept track of her since she was putting stuff out like digital only through Brain Feeder, which is Flying Lotus's record label. 
but um, when you commission or hire, or however you want to put it, a guest vocalist as a dance artist, like it's pretty rare they actually do a memorable job. I'm not saying they do a bad job, they do a good job, but in terms of like actually making an impact to the listener, you're usually talking about um, kind of generic vocals with generic lyrics and they just kind of do a generic thing for the song. The song is really about the production and the vocals are really just there. I don't know why. I, I Generally, I think they could the song would be better without vocals. But um, Cal Regards, uh, I'm not a fan of their English speaking vocalists, any of them, uh, lyrically or delivery wise. Um, their Chinese, uh, both MCs and vocalists that they pair with their production, I'm a big fan of that stuff. It's really funky, really different, really weird. And of course, I have no idea what they're saying, but that's kind of the point. Um, it's, uh, you know, I, I heard this year, I learned this year that a lot of people have a disdain for British hip hop just because it, I don't know, it's kind of goofy. I've always felt that way too. So it was funny to learn other people feel that way. The Chinese hip hop on uh, Cal Regards' productions, to me, is really like, I don't know, it's 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 really cool. I like it. It gets down. We're just going to keep rolling. Uh, up next is Roizen Machine. Of all the albums we're going to talk about, this is probably, if you just look at it across multiple criteria, this is probably the best. This is probably, I don't know if it's my favorite, but... I like it a lot, and I would say objectively, it's one of the best albums this year. Uh, Royzen Murphy was the vocalist for a band called Malaco way back when. Their first album was called Tight Sweater. If I'm not mistaken, it was named as such because the producer and Royzen Murphy, the uh, vocalist, uh, they met because the producer liked her tight sweater and she wasn't wearing a bra under it. <laughs> so a little uh, Malaco mythology there. But Royzen Murphy has been killing it for a while now. Um, I forget the name of her album. Uh, I think it was called Hairless Animals or something in 2015. That was really tight. I was really impressed, especially with her as a older artist who has been around for a while. A very abstract electronic music that still, uh, electronic music album that still kept the listener engaged. It was very highbrow music while seeming very lowbrow. It was very danceable and like funky. Um, and her vocals are just solid gold. Like she's a pro and she, she always has been. Um, but so she's been killing it for a while now. And I don't know how much that has been amounting to critical or financial success for her. I would hope like pretty well. Um, but, uh, so she had that in 2000, I think it's called hairless machines or hairless animals or something like that in 2015. Then in, I think it was 2017 or 18, she had take her up to Monto. I think it's called. Um, another great album, um, just the way that she shifted personas between those albums really reminded me of like David Bowie, um, really reminded me of David Bowie, just the, you know, when she's dealing with personas, she's dealing with very much with things she's like dreamed up, not with like stick figure personas, which was David Bowie's thing. I mean, the thin white Duke, like who would have thought of that? Uh, Royce and Murphy's persona on Take Her Up to Monto, another just weird persona that only she, uh, I think, would have thought of. Um, but yeah, she's been killing it for a while. But up to this point, her music was really abstract, I would say, to the point that she almost seemed to have a career trajectory not too dissimilar from that of Scott Walker, where as she gets older, she just gets weirder. I have no problem with that. Scott Walker is probably, when you consider his entire life, probably the greatest I would say musician ever. Uh, yeah, his best work was at the end of his life. And if you look at anybody in the Beatles, anybody in the Who or whatever, you can't say that about any of the other man members. Like they stagnate when they're 40 or when they're 50. Uh, Scott Walker, that guy was going strong, going real strong up until he died. The last thing he did was the uh, soundtrack to a movie called Vox Lux. Check it out. It slays. Uh, but anyway, so Rosa Murphy kind of looked like she had that kind of tr career trajectory going on. Not so, though, this year. Uh, this is a pure pop and dance album. Um, as every critic has cited, pretty integral in its DNA is disco, but not the disco that you know of and probably uh, the disco that you hate. I can't stand disco. Uh, this has a really angular, chopped up, exaggerated, mutated, and frankly, bizarre take on disco. So that's some commentary on, you know, 
the music leading up to this album, which, like I say, made its being a very poppy album a big, big surprise. Um, and the production, which was done by a guy named DJ Parrot, you should check him out. Um, he is flawless on this. It is nuts. Uh, but let's talk about Royce and Murphy on this album. Um, her vocals are amazing. Like, the, uh, yeah, just the the odd run she does. Uh, it's ornate without being overly flashy. Um, she has a good talking voice. She can go from zero to 60 with her vocals, like, you know, talking kind of smooth and sexy. And then, you know, layer on embellishments as the song goes on until she's really crooning. She's great. You can tell she's a pro. Um, uh, also, you know, she's Irish. I always like to see Irish musicians do really well because, like, I was on a tour bus in Ireland and all they would play is U2. Like, U2 was the only good band from Ireland ever. Um, which, you know, there haven't been that many famous bands from Ireland. Uh, David Gray, Glenn Hansard, um, and, you know, all of those are of the, including you two, are of the singer songwritery sort of DNA. But uh, Royce and Murphy, I hope she becomes a legend after this album. Um, lyrically, this, this album's amazing. Her lyrics are. For a, like, usually you're a good vocalist and a crummy lyri lyricist or a good lyricist and not that great of a vocalist. Uh, so usually you're either a Tom Jones or you're a Leonard Cohen. Leonard Cohen can't sing, but he can write a cool song. Tom Jones can't write a song that means anything to anybody, but he can sing. Just kind of a like primitive, probably not completely correct, but hopefully a way that gives a little bit of perspective. Uh, but Roy's in Roy's in a machine here. She has the. She's got the whole package on this album. Um, a lot of her lyrics. Uh, every song on the album kind of has a common theme to it. A lot of it's about like greed and wanting more, um, which is pretty quintessentially covered on the song "Something More." Uh, the lyrics of that song are really interesting because she's talking about all the stuff she has. It's almost like a hip hop song, like. You know, she's banging a lot of people. She's got a lot of money. She's got houses, fancy restaurants, but she keeps saying she wants something more. And it has this like dual meaning that you can kind of glean from it. Does she want more stuff? Like, is it a song that she is completely approving of herself and everything she wants? Or does she want something higher uh, and something she hasn't found in everything she just listed? She never specifies that. The listener can take away can take the song either way, which is really, really cool. I love songs that leave room for the listener to interpret uh, and stuff like that. Um, I did want to say We Got Together is a jam. Murphy's Law is one of the greatest singles I've ever heard uh, in terms of just piquing people's interest about this album. It was a insane single. Um, I'm pretty sure this album hopefully not because of lack of sales of her other albums, but I'm pretty sure it was planned to be a digital release only. And then it got a ton of good reviews, became, from what I could tell, super popular, and they put out a bunch of vinyl, and I have one of them. Um, but uh, but anyway, so Mur Murphy's Law, is that's a killer single. Like, if you don't listen to anything else, just listen to that. Uh, I did want to say, though, the whole album, Royce and Murphy kind of paints herself as this, like, sort of, like, insatiable goddess with, like, superpowers and, and i don't know just some like kind of a mystical dimension uh i did want to say also the first line of the album this is a simulation over and over is just really eerie almost like airbag on okay computer by radiohead how i don't know just the kind of that mechanized feel uh that's a really good opening line for an album like gets your attention right away very memorable but track nine narcissist I don't like disco, so it took me a little bit to warm up to it. But the vocal production on Narcissus, that stuff is insane. And the bass line is insane, the way it's chopped up. And when the string section comes in and kind of deconstructs the whole song, the way that's chopped up, uh, those three in that song, completely mind-boggling. Like, you you really have to pinch yourself and, want, and ask yourself, like, what am I listening to right now when you hear Narcissus by Royce and Murphy? Check this album out. Like, if you didn't glean that yet, check it out. All right, I'm just going to keep on rolling. I'm not going to have as much to say about this one because it's pretty straightforward, but it's a very good album. Uh, Violent Soho, what's it called? Everything is A-OK. -okay. Uh, on Pure Noise Records, they were on Side One Dummy, which was kind of cool. Side One Dummy is a label that I have always that I liked in, like, middle school and then never picked up again. Um, but it was cool to see them have an actually cool band on their label. And you can see this is on this weird, like... 
They had some sort of like salesy name for it, but it's yellow and orange splatter, which is which is cool. It'll probably be worth some money someday. I know Waco albums on red vinyl are worth a ton on eBay. Uh, but anyway, they had a 2016 album called Waco that was really good on Side One Dummy. And this album is every bit as good, uh, very much in the same vein of that album in terms of production, uh, songwriting, and just general music style. If you like 90s music, uh, like, you know, even if it's like guilty pleasure stuff like it is with me, or if whether you like it or not, it was, you know, kind of formative in the type of music that you listen to, stuff like Papa Roach, <laughs> Three Doors Down, um, even bands like The Wallflowers, uh, Violent So have, have a little bit of all that mixed in and they make it super cool to where it doesn't have to be a guilty pleasure for you anymore. Uh, the second track, which is, you know, is always a single vacation year. The, that's a really ca killer song. Lying on the Floor was really good. Uh, there's a couple acoustic songs on here too that are really well written. I generally don't like acoustic guitar or slow songs in general. Um, there are a fair amount on here, but they're all really well done. And... If you like Waco, if you haven't listened by, to Waco by Violent So, check it out. That's an amazing album. If you don't want to check it out or have already check it out, check out Everything is A-OK. -okay. I've heard some people don't like this one, but I feel like this is really Waco part two. Like it's it's really good. So here's one you're probably not going to know. This is on Paper Bag Records, just like Zune. Lou Cannon, Automatic Body. Um, so I heard about this one through Paper Bag Records newsletter. Usually their stuff is too indie or folky for me, but this is actually an electronic music album. So I was like, hey, I'll check it out. And uh, upon listening to it, it reminded me a little bit of Glasser, which I'm a sucker for Glasser. Um, the, uh, I hope this doesn't sound sexist or something, but the, the female voice is so conducive to well-done electronic music, especially when the same, when the vocalist and the producer are one and the same and they have that kind of, uh, this is such a lame word, but like synergy going. Um, I really like female producers who sing over their music and do both of the two well. Um, I generally do not like male vocals on electronic music. Um, I, like I say, I don't know if that's sexist or whatever, but it, it really just comes down to the sound of it. Um, but anyway, if you like Glasser, Lou Cannon is definitely worth checking out. She isn't as much of a virtuoso as Glasser is. Her production... Is, seems a little bit more conservative and maybe even a little bit more hesitant than um, Glasser's kind of like like crunk stuff. But uh, and she's also not as uh, as much of a I don't know virtuoso vocalist. Like she does a lot more sort of talking stuff um, than Glasser does. Glasser is a little bit Bjork like in her singing. Uh, but Luke Han's a really good lyricist. She's real good. Um, there was just one thing I kind of thought of to say about this before I went on camera and it was this, um, usually when I'm listening to a song and the lyrics like get to me at some level, it's because they're describing some experience that I've experienced before. And maybe I didn't think anybody else had experienced. Like there's a very powerful thing in music and was one of the things that like attracted me to music early on. Um, and is why I'm still kind of a junkie for it. Cause like once you kind of experience that. I think music's the only thing that can give you that. Um, although I've I've seen some cool paintings in the Richmond Art Museum. This is so random uh, that I, I thought were pretty cool in that aspect too. Um, almost like pictures of memories, that I, my memories, uh, which is cool. Check out the Richmond Art Museum. Uh, but anyway, uh, Luke Cannon sings about stuff that's very like feminine and womanly, uh, especially a woman who's like living kind of a domestic like career and family life but there's a lot of tension behind that not something that describes my past present or future situation at all but her lyrics are so uh just so well cur curated and the experiences that she describes and the emotions that she attaches to them uh that it was really easy for me to get into at a really deep level uh her like <clears throat> as a songwriter even though i had nothing in common with her and i don't know if there's another songwriter that I can say that about. Um, if you're gonna listen to one track off this album, check out the first single, Ancient Chamber. That's a jam. If you don't like it, you're not gonna like anything probably. I will say the second track, M-O-T-R, is really abstract and like, in my opinion, not that great, but it is the second track on the album, which is usually the single slot, and it's the song that NPR reviewed. Um, and of course, all most music on NPR 
I would even go so far to say all music on NPR sucks usually. Like if it's on NPR, NPR is good at news. They're not good at like cool culture. If it's on NPR, it's lame generally. But uh, this was on NPR and it's not lame, but NPR didn't get it at all. Like you could tell their reviewer was just like, oh, somebody put me on this, de- put this on my desk and told me I had to review it. So here's a little ba- bit about it. It's weird, which is n- not a bad description. It's weird. But it was weird that this song, M-O-T-R, uh, was selected as the single and like PR song for the for the album. Uh, I don't know about that. Uh, Ancient Chamber is really good, though. Don't worry about this song. Um, and then let's see. Next to you is cool. Uh, it sounds like something from a David Lynch movie. Very Angelo Badalamente sort of vibe. Very well pulled off. A lot of people try to do that. And, you know, Angelo Badalamente is Angelo Badalamente. I think that's how you say his name. Um, but yeah, the next to you sounds like something from Twin Peaks, the show. That's really, and it's very well executed. Um, and then this whole like middle chunk of music is, is really, really good. Uh, Fight Until We Feel and Invisible Desire, I think are both really good songs, very memorable. And uh, Lou Cannon had another album called Suspicious, I think, in 2017. While I would say that album has more jams than this one does, this one's a little bit more subdued. This one's more cohesive, and the whole album almost runs like one big song or one big movement, which I appreciate. Uh, It's very well melded together, and I would definitely check Lou Cannon out. Uh, I did want to mention something cool about this vinyl. It's actually autographed by Lou Cannon. You can see that, and it's individually numbered. I actually got... I got the very first pre-order. So this is the very first album, at least numbered, probably pressed of this album. It's number one out of 150. So that's pretty dope. Um, I also want to say I felt sorry for Lou Cannon because uh, she didn't get to tour this year. I felt sorry for any artist this year who put something out and didn't get to tour. So I don't think this album made the big splash that it could have. But uh, definitely listen to it. It's, it's, it's real good. Chase me 